joining us, John. We really appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, you are a, a serial investor uh, and, and you had significant business successes of your own uh, over the years as well. I wonder if, if we could kick off just by you telling us a bit about your background and your, your business journey to date. Well, Chris, um, uh, believe it or not, I was a lawyer a long time ago. Um, initially a historian, um, and then I qualified as a lawyer, both um, here in the UK and in Hong Kong. And I worked uh, in the city and for, I, I guess I left law when I was about five, five and a half years qualified. And I went on then to, um, to set up a company called Links of London with my wife, Anushka. Uh, and uh, we ran that company for about um, 15 years, although I was, uh, so it was my night job uh, as a lawyer. Um, and then it became my day job. Um, and we sold Links of London um, in two, 2006, 2007. Um, and uh, we both left the company. Um, I uh, decided that um, having done, you know, a decade as, uh, as a lawyer and a decade as a sort of um, completely uh, focused on one business entrepreneur, uh, decided that I wanted to have a broader portfolio and I became an investor. Um, I uh, invested uh, right at the start of uh, Bremont Watch Company and I, uh, I chaired that business for 10 years. In fact, I was the largest shareholder. Um, and at the same time, invested at the start of All of Our Brown, which was a swimwear uh, company that um, we sold to Chanel about uh, two years ago. Um, and at the same time, I've continued in my own entrepreneurial journey in that um, Anushka and I set up a fine jewelry business called Anushka. Uh, that has been going for um, approximately 10 years. It's a very different beast to, uh, to Links of London. And I guess we took into Anushka all that we'd learnt from being in the jewellery business um, over, that, uh, over that period. As an investor, you, you have invested in a number of, of businesses. Mainly, they seem to be mainly in, in luxury goods. Is that, is that a conscious investment strategy or is that just, just where your interest takes you? Well, I think, um, you know, when we started uh, Links of London, we really didn't have a clue what we were doing uh, in the jewellery industry. And I think we went into um, uh, the jewellery industry with a very fresh eye. And at that time, um, you know, there weren't many jewellery brands. So the, there were the big brands that had been around, you know, many of them from the 19th century, but there were no new, um, new brands coming through. Um, that's changed a lot over the last uh, sort of 20, 30 years. But uh, we took great inspiration from uh, the cosmetics industry, you know, where that ability to package things up and, uh, and, and sell them at a premium. And that's very much, you know, what we were doing at Lynx. Is if we were doing uh, sterling silver, but we were beautifully wrapping it up and packaging it and creating, um, creating a brand. So... That's where I learned about brands. And um, I do tend, when I invest and when I get involved in businesses, I do tend to stick to what I know. And I do shy away, uh, away from what I don't know. Um, so, you know, my, my portfolio currently is, um, you know, Dash Water. Uh, I was an early investor in Revolut, which was really very consumer focused banking. Um, the Restory, which is a wonderful uh, small company that's all about uh, the restoration of, of um, uh, accessories, particularly leather accessories, um, you know, marketplaces like Feastit and Vinteria. So it's all very consumer driven. And uh, I put myself uh, into the place of the consumer and think, you know, is this something I want? Would I buy it? You know, how do I feel about it? Does it meet a need? And um, yeah, so so I stuck to my knitting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as an investment strategy, it seems to be working. Uh, you've got some some fantastic uh, brands in your portfolio. Uh, you're also very well known for for mentoring and supporting 
uh, British businesses and, and, and emerging entrepreneurs. Is that something that, that is, is a, uh, a strong passion for you? Well, I, 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 um, I sort of, uh, I, I, while I was at law school, I, um, I did a lot of tutoring in history and uh, for, for, a, uh, for a tutorial college, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. And um, in fact, at university, I used to, uh, I was a tour guide for Americans coming over, American students coming over to, to the UK to earn my living. And so I've always enjoyed that sort of mentoring, teaching sort of um, bit. And um, after we sold links, I was sort of, you know, didn't have much to do. And um, I was sitting on the board of Walpole, which is the organization for British luxury. And um, I decided to take on the role of creating a, a, a mentorship thing called Brands of Tomorrow. Yeah. And um, I think that first year we had six brands we chose and we used all the expertise within the membership of Walpole uh, to help um, mentor these budding entrepreneurs. And actually, you know, so much of the energy and um, newness comes out of these smaller companies that have, you know, because they don't have the funds or the resources, have to be so much more innovative to cut through than the larger companies who can get a bit lazy and, uh, and, and, and boring. But I think we found that it was very much a two-way traffic. I think the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the mentors gained as much through the program as the mentees. Do you feel that, that entrepreneurs in those early stages of business uh, should, should always be seeking mentorship, either through an organization or through, through their, their, their networks? Do you think there's value to be sought? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think um, uh, I think uh, it's a sounding board. I mean, it's interesting. Anushka, um, uh, the person as well as the company, does a lot of mentoring at Central St. Martins in the jewellery course. Uh, and we sponsor uh, the sort of jewellery prize. And she always uh, says to me, you know, it's extraordinary. Um, I can just talk about what I've done and where I've been with in, in, in my jewelry, jewelry design career. And people find it immensely useful in a way that she couldn't possibly imagine. Maybe it gives some confidence. Uh, it gives them uh, the feeling that other people have been down that route before, that everything is possible. Uh, it's less intimidating. So I think just hearing these stories and realizing that, um, you know, other people have done it is mm. deeply helpful as well as the um as well as the very specific questions around you know should i raise money where do i go mm -hmm. you know uh, how do i protect my intellectual property all, all, all this sort of uh, general knowledge mm -hmm. around brands and entrepreneurship no that makes sense absolutely speaking of anushka uh, your your wife uh, you've co-founded two businesses with her now yeah uh, how, how is it working with a, with a spouse? Because I'm sure that, that it's, it's fairly common for entrepreneurs at an early stage businesses to be uh, um, spousal uh, couples setting them up. So but can you tell us about your experience of working with your, with your wife, how, how you uh, split the responsibilities of work, work, how it was taking work home with you, whether you, were, you could leave work at the door, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean you're right. There are a lot. There are quite a number of examples um, of uh, a very successful um, uh, businesses set up by uh, husbands and wives teams. Um, less success on the marriage front. <laughs> um, but uh, we, I mean, we've done it for a long time now. We've been married thirty years, um, and. Um, I think the first point to make is that um, uh, I think when you start a business, I think it's enormously useful having a partner. Um, I think having somebody who, uh, who should be complementary, um, creating a bit of self-awareness. An entrepreneur needs to be self-aware, needs to understand what they're not good at. Mm. I think that's a very good starting point. And therefore, when you're selecting either a partner or indeed your early employees, understanding you know you know if you're if you're really bad at um numbers you know the first high you need to make is somebody who's really good at numbers um 
if you find it very difficult to uh, uh, come up with sort of creative ideas, you need a creative person. So I think that um, uh, I think that's important that you there is a self awareness and you understand who you know. And I don't think you know you should never have you should never fear uh, recruiting somebody who's better than you are. You should always be looking for people who are better in their particular areas than you are. I think that's a that's a rookie error to just get people who can do things but not as well as you can. Um, so I think it's very important to find a partner. And I think it's also, it avoids that sort of whole thing, people believing their own bullshit. I think that, yeah. that I think it's very important that there's a bit of humility there. And you've got somebody who you absolutely trust, who can say, John, you are so wrong there. You know, don't be an idiot. Or, you know, you don't really think that, do you? And, and can bring you down. And I think that, um, so, you know, there are many examples of great entrepreneurial, partnerships so i think the first thing is so if, if your wife or your husband happens to be that uh, that person that's great um and you, you know that's the person who you should be able to trust um you know often in marriages opposites attract um you often have complementary skills um for us i was more of the um i've always seen myself in a sort of chairman type role that, that my job was to look around the corners and see what's coming mm -hmm. um and, and I've always uh, more recently liked to work with very uh, good operational CEOs who can make things happen today and maybe tomorrow, but I'll be thinking about next week. And I've always found that's my, um, and that may be uh, something to do with my legal training. I mean, you know, I, I'm always thinking about a lot further ahead usually than most people and looking at the implication of the decisions now. So, so the, the, really the, the, the... The takeaway there is that you should, as an entrepreneur, not work in isolation, but find a team with complementary skills that, that, that fill the gaps that, that you have in, in yourself and, and that allow you to play to your strengths. I think, I think that's right. I mean, with Anushka, um, you know, she has a tremendous, you know, as a designer, she has a tremendous visual uh, ability. And... Um, you know, I learned very quickly that when we did board packs, you know, there needed to be lots of graphs, rows of numbers she had no concept of. Give her a graph and show something graphically. And, and you know, you learn that because uh, on a board, and particularly, you know, as a, as a growing business, you know, you go through various stages of um, putting in structure, governance and so forth, you know, um, you need a diverse board with diverse skills. So, you know, and you need to address how people like to see their documents or how people like, you know, you, you, you've got to think about that and particularly in a creative business. So she's very much the, the visual, um, brilliant at the design and branding. And I'm very much about um, uh, operational efficiency, um, you know, possibly selling, um, quite creative functions but not necessarily visual i guess that one of the points as well that, that you pick up on there is that as an individual as an entrepreneur it's having the confidence to say i'm not good at everything uh that that i i, I might need help i might need uh to bring in other people i can't do this all by myself yeah i mean that's an early lesson i think and that comes through delegation there's a limit to what each person can do mm. and um and I think that uh, that's a lesson that um, that needs to be learned quite early on. Absolutely, I'm sure there's there's a, a sense of being a control freak amongst all entrepreneurs as they want things to be just so. And, and I imagine they 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 set up businesses because they don't because they want to be their own bosses and want to be in control of their own destinies. But again, and they don't take point, orders. Exactly, but at some point you have to you have to learn to delegate if you want to scale. I'd like to move us on to talking about uh, general entrepreneurship, if I may. So, John, what, as, a, as a, uh, an entrepreneur, how do you know when you've got a good idea? How do you know when, when, when your business is one that, that is, is worth pursuing? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, um, I'm not sure the idea is the most important thing. So as an investor, when I look at a, uh, I get lots of um, business plans that, uh, that come through 
on email. Um, the, the, my first thought is is the individual, um, the person, and um, I do quite a lot of referencing, and um, I'm really interested in their education. I'm really interested in in what they've done. It really interested in what sort of makes them tick, how curious they are. So that's sort of the starting point. Um, and do I like that person? Because um, I tend to be a very active investor in the sense I will, uh, you know, I I want to be able to help that person, and particularly in the early stages, you know, um, uh, you know, with Bremont, uh, you know, when we started, um, Nick and Giles English, you know, they didn't know the watch and jewellery market. I just sold links of London. I dealt with all the best jewellers in the UK and, and, and many in America. So I was able to help them enormously in those first two or three years. And then, of course, by 10 years, you know, I couldn't teach them anything because they knew it all. But the early years um, uh, are very important. So getting on with somebody is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think the... Um, the second thing is the idea and the third thing really is the um execution um the idea is not necessarily the most important thing um i think that uh you know that you you know if you said well i'm going to start a shirt company you know there are millions of shirt companies or i'm going to start a jewelry business it's not really about um uh, you know, if you're the best shirt company and you execute brilliantly and you have a brilliant customer service and you have brilliant uh, 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 sourcing and design and everything else, you could actually grab market share and become a very successful business. So the idea doesn't have to be a genius idea. I mean, there are exceptions. It's not necessarily always about disrupting a market. It's just about doing things better, doing things differently. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about uh, Warby Parker, I mean, they, they, you know, another great example, a wonderful sort of tech-enabled business. But at the end of the day, it's an optician selling online yeah. with uh, 60 something shops. But um, they just do it better. Mm. And, and they present the product to the, to the customer in a way that the customer really, you know, wants it, which is online, virtual, all the rest of it. Um, and, and I think that, um, so I, I do look at the idea, having said all that, you know, but, and I like the idea where you offer a simple solution to, to, to a problem, to, to, to you know, um, uh, Dash was very interesting, Dash Water. And their whole thing is, you know, they, they appeal to the millennials. Uh, it's uh, sparkling water infused with wonky fruit. There's no, right. no calories, no sweetness um and no cal uh, calories mm -hmm. so no sugar sorry no sugar no sweetness no calories and they take the fruit that farmers can't sell to the supermarkets which would otherwise be wasted mm -hmm. and infuse it into fizzy water and it's in a recyclable can so it's a very very carefully curated idea and i love the idea of that it's a b core um and it it just ticks all the boxes that uh that the millennial audience are looking for. Mm. So um, I, I, the other thing I always look at is, is how big is the opportunity? Mm -hmm. In terms of scalability? There's, well, it, well there, there, I think there are two questions there, aren't there? How big is the opportunity and how can you scale it? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in a, in a huge market where, you know, um, you know, you only have to get a tiny bit of the market to create a very substantial business. And, um, you know, there is something very attractive about the shirt market because people replace their shirts every, you know, three or four months if they wear them, you know. Um, Jewellery tends to be a bit more discretionary mm -hmm. and therefore it's more difficult. Uh, the marketing cycle is more difficult and the lifetime cycle is more difficult. I'd like to move on to talking about... Uh, entrepreneurs taking the leap from uh, doing, I guess, their, their, their business ventures on the side to, to taking the leap to, to that being their full-time occupation. Uh, you, you were a corporate lawyer yourself um, mm. and, and moved into 
into business. At what point do you, does one feel that it's the right time to do that, to put it on the line? And is there, is there ever a right time or do you just have to take the lead? No, I, I don't think there's ever a good time. I do think, though, that you can do an awful lot um, in terms of bootstrapping a business. And some of the most impressive entrepreneurs you meet are people who have literally bootstrapped a business for, for 12 months and built up momentum and proven the idea, you know, using credit cards. And, uh, you know, and I mean, that's immensely, um, immensely um, uh, great, good to see. I mean, I, you know, I, what I like when I uh, meet entrepreneurs is entrepreneurs who've got real grit. I mean, uh, it's a bit like um, the restory, um, you know, Vanessa Jacobs, great woman entrepreneur. You know, she has, um, she's been at the head of this whole sort of tech enabled repair service. And, you know, she's had, she, she really, re really struggled for three years mm -hmm. and it's come good. You know, she's, she's really, I mean, she's right at the center of this whole sustainability revolution, but it hasn't come quickly. And that whole idea of bootstrapping, determination, resilience, all the rest of it is, um, is really important. You, you, you can't give up. They're the real traits of an entrepreneur, aren't they? Is, is that, that, that determination uh, not, not to give up when, when times get tough? Yeah, I mean, I had, one, I, I had one investment some years ago that I did in a very successful uh, designer um, who uh, one day rang me up and said, John, I can't go on. And I said, well, look, your, your shareholders are willing to support you. You know, you're, you're, you, you, we think you're fantastic. He said, I just can't do it. And I'm going to have to close down. And he did. So it's rare that you see that, you know, but, but sometimes it happens that people just find it too much yeah. um, and find the intensity too much and, and it affects their private life too much. And there's no getting away from, from, from the fact that, that, that a high number of, of early stage businesses do fail for, for various reasons. Um, do, do you, in your experience, get a sense of, of what the main reasons are as to why those businesses fail in those, say, first three years? Well, the obvious statement is that they run out of money. Mm. Um, I, uh, I, I, and that's the, the, the most common reason. Um, and I think that uh, those businesses that have been funded by outside money and obviously a lot of businesses do get funded by, uh, by early investors, angel investors, they lose the confidence of their investors and their shareholders. And um, I think that um, uh, that is the most important thing. So if you, take, if you decide to start up a business, you decide to bring in investors, you have got to continue to communicate with those investors. The last thing, I mean, the thing I really dread is somebody coming back to me, you know, having not heard from them for months and saying, can you give me more money? As an entrepreneur, you should be keeping your investors and your shareholders up to date with good news and bad news throughout the period of investment. And then when you go to them and say, look, I need some help, they're much more likely to support you. And... Um, so that's a big lesson, you know, um, uh, keep very close to, to, to investors, because often you'll get to a stage where a business might hit a, a, a bumpy patch and you need some additional investment, very unlikely to get it from the banks at the early stages. And you need them to, to stump up. Now, their inclination, if they've been kept in, in touch, will be to do that to protect their existing investment. Uh, unless they've been asked time and time again and uh, have run out of patience. And I think that the, the final thing, which I often say, is that you, you've you got to... Um, it, there's nothing worse than um, uh, overconfidence and, um, you know, um, constantly disappointing investors. Mm -hmm. um, and And if you do that their patience runs dry. 
Um, and some of the best businesses I've invested in, you know, the entrepreneurs have, have you know, under-promised and over-delivered. Yeah. Often uh, uh, female-led businesses do that, interestingly enough. I mean, I love uh, investing in female-led businesses. There's one, um, there's a pet food business that I invested in very early called Scrumbles. And it's been going three years and, you know, constantly hits its numbers, um, constantly uh, very strong um, uh, communications with shareholders, very strong communications with customers, just a great business run, you know, by a couple again. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so I think that's really important. And, and, and those businesses will always get funded. Uh, their dilution will always be less. They're able to uh, justify strong valuations based on future numbers because the investors believe them. Uh, it's, it's, it's by far the best way. I think that's very interesting uh, what you say about, about female founded businesses and, and the way that, that women tend to uh, approach things in, in a, perhaps a more, um, well, I don't know what, what quite the word is, but it's they, 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 they downplay their success. Is that, is that perhaps what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, I think they, um, I think the, uh, I mean, it, it has a, a, another side. I think that uh, women can sometimes be not ambitious enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll verge on playing safe. And I find quite often uh, in, um, in entrepreneurial situations where I, as the chairman or the advisor or the investor, have had to say to the entrepreneur, you don't realize how valuable the thing that you created is or there comes a moment in the life cycle of the company where actually the opportunity becomes enormous. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneur may have been peddling away for three years or four years or longer, and suddenly got to a moment where there is a tipping point. Awareness becomes much greater, people, word of mouth becomes much stronger, and there is an opportunity. And, and you know, businesses do, they go in a cycle. and. Um, and sometimes, uh, um, you know, women who are very good at, um, at d delivering what they say they're going to do, it's a big generalization, um, and um, uh, will sometimes not see the opportunity quite as much, whereas men will come in and promise the earth and deliver far short of that. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting. And that, and that may just be the, the, the landscape that... that... Uh, female entrepreneurs are, uh, are working in and the hurdles that they faced. Uh, I'm thinking back to yeah. the the Alison Rose report of the the, the barriers for, for female entrepreneurs, and it, perhaps they they're just 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 working in a slightly different environment uh, to to the male entrepreneurs. I'd like to just move us on, John, to talking about business growth, if I may. Um, so so you've you've scaled businesses, um, and and you've uh, You've worked on both sides of the fence, both as the business owner and, and the investor. So can I ask you about, about seeking funding? Um, I'm, a, I'm a business owner. I'm at a certain stage of funding, perhaps uh, a certain stage of growth, perhaps where I'm looking to move from friends and family investment into that second round. What, what advice would you give me if I'm in that situation? I think good entrepreneurs create uh, good networks and very, work very hard on their networks. And I think that, um, I think that's very important. And I think you often have to talk to uh, investors long before they actually write a check. Um, I mean, personally, I don't, you know, I, I like to get to know somebody before I put money into their business. And I'll sometimes say no on the first round and then invest in the second round, if I feel uncomfortable about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that uh, developing networks um, and, um, you know, I mean, I think we're very lucky. I mean, you know, a couple of my investments uh, uh, have found me through LinkedIn. Really? Yeah. I mean, so a really cold call. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's very interesting. I mean, now, you know, one of them, uh, you know, three years down the line, I feel I've known, you know, the two entrepreneurs for years. But actually, it was, if you like, a blind date over, over LinkedIn. So I think you can, you know, in terms of finding angels, and, and you know, uh, I think you can, you, you can find them. Mm. Um, 
I think uh, there are all sorts of interesting angel funding um, organizations. I think they're, uh, they're very useful. Um, I think crowdfunding is an option, um, particularly if you, I mean, I think what, what, I mean, one of the learnings of having done it a couple of times uh, is that you do need probably 25 to 30% of the funds you're seeking pre-committed before you go live on the platform. Right. But, you know, crowdfunding is becoming more and more mainstream. Mm. I think Crowdcube have now got a million investors, you know, on wow. the thing. So, you know, it's a, it's a proper, proper number of people. Mm. Um, so I think that, um, you know, uh, that, that's where I advise people to start. I think also um, what quite often happens, and some of the angel funds have, have worked on this, if you have a prominent angel who uh, likes what you're doing, uh, they will often have people who will follow them. I'm sure as an investor, the, <clears throat> the questions that you ask um, are, are, I'm sure, about financials, about, about uh, projected growth and, and, and business plans. But is there anything that a business owner should be asking the investor? Does it matter who the investor is or is it just about securing the capital? Well, I think a lot of people talk about value added investors. Um, and I think at the very early stages, um, it can be very useful to have uh, people who, you know, might have, for instance, say if you're dash water, it might be people who've got, you know, um, uh, you've got uh, contacts with supermarkets or you know the restaurant sector uh, very well or, you know, that type of thing, very much introductions, open your address book, all this type of thing. I think that can be very useful at an early stage. Uh, and it can just move things along a bit quicker. Um, I think as the business matures, that's less effective. And you probably exhausted the address book of your various value added investors. And at that point, you would typically bring together a small core of investors. You might call them an advisory board. You might call them a board of directors. Doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And I think at that stage, um, that, that's an interesting evolution. That's where actually you take your advice from, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs can be guilty of just, you know, getting too much advice, frankly, talking to too many people right. and just reflecting the views of the last person they spoke to. And I think, um, so I think it's important when you get past that early stage that you then um, uh, find somebody or, or, or some people that can give you some sort of ongoing strategic advice and challenge and challenge your decisions. A lot of uh, smaller businesses um, get diverted from their core proposition. You know, you shouldn't really be doing uh, global sales until you've got your home market absolutely nailed. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be diversifying your product until you've got your core product absolutely nailed. That's a very interesting point because I'm sure that a lot of businesses see international growth as as uh, the, the the big next step that that, that they're absolutely keen to take. Um, I, I know that, that Anishka and and LinkedIn London ultimately have, have gone international. So is there a is there a right time to start looking internationally? Well, a very wise person once told me it, it takes 10 years to establish yourself in your home market and another 10 years to establish yourself internationally. Wow. And, the, and, and, and I think um, there's a lot, of, a lot of truth in that. Um, and I think that, um, I think it, uh, in the businesses I, I, I've been involved in, I've always been very keen to have a very, very strong home market. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and to not rush too early into international opportunities and to test it quite quickly. And, uh, you know, if a business says, to, you know, it, it rather depends on how fast growing it is, but if a business says to me, you know, we're going to wait for three or five years to get to, to start to go overseas. Um, that's good. I mean, I, I interesting, I, I talked about War, Warby Parker earlier. I mean, they have not gone overseas yet. I mean, the U.S. optical market is a third of the world market. They see 
they see uh, a huge opportunity within the US. They want to keep their business as simple and as profitable as possible. And therefore the US is where they're gonna stick, stick at. And so they've got no ambition at the current thing to go a, a, abroad, which is very surprising given they're very highly profitable and very successful. And, um, and often, you know, going overseas brings with it um, a lot of cost, a lot of risk and a lot of complexity. Mm. So you should just wait really until you've got your proposition absolutely nailed in this country. When a business is, is flourishing, when it's, when it's uh, mature, when it's, uh, when, when it's had <clears throat> a good degree of success, at what point does a founder start considering exit, start considering moving on to the, the next project? Well, that, it's an interesting question about exit. Um, uh, we, uh, we decided to sell uh, links um fairly early on in the journey um you know we could have kept it we could have still be running it um but um i think at the at the time um we knew that we had people who were interested in buying it we knew if we did a sales process that there would be some bids and uh, we knew that that would be sort of life-changing and would sort of secure the future with four children and you know the age of 40 and so forth. Um, so, uh, so that was a decision we took, but uh, we have a number of other entrepreneurial friends who have said, you know, God, I'd never have done what you did and who have stuck at the knitting and um, have, uh, you know, own, you know, own hundred percent or 95% of their companies and have, um, you know, love running them. Mm. So, um, uh, I think Anushka and I felt we enjoyed uh, we enjoyed doing lots of different things, and actually, you know, the idea of running the same company thirty years on uh, was not as appealing, because you know, contrary to what people say, you know, it's not all about the money. It's about you know whether you enjoyed doing what you did. So I think that um, so there are two different camps there. I think if you uh, if you take on investment that puts a significant pressure on to find some sort of exit for your investors. And I think you should always be very aware of that. You know, there are other ways of growing companies. You just grow them slower and you retain the ownership. So is it, is it, is, is it a certain, is it to a certain degree to do with emotional attachment? Because the moment you take on external investment, it's, it's less yours and, and, exit is obviously the the ultimate emotional decision uh when it's a a, a a business that you've created is your baby um so so again is is it is it about emotional the ability to detach yourself emotionally from your business yeah i think i think um i think you're right um there is a strong emotional attachment to a business that you've created yourself and you know inevitably if you do that with a very close friend or your partner or your husband or wife then it becomes part of your life story uh, and it goes even deeper um but uh equally um you know it's ve it's very stressful uh or can be very stressful running a business and the uh, uh and um uh, the, the sort of the, the lure of um financial stability which for me was very important and Anushka you know we weren't uh you know we'd, we we uh, uh yeah we didn't have lots of money mm -hmm. um and uh, we had very high overheads and it was a, a very attractive um sort of life choice and I think that um but it is a there's a quite a, a there's a funny feeling when you've sold you know, a business that you've worked at for 15 plus years, created it and, and, um, and, and, you know, you wake up the next morning and the only email you've got is from Tesco. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask what, what, I'm sure it's a huge mix of emotions you feel having uh, sold uh, a, a business. Is it, is it elation? Is it celebration? Or is it a sense of loss? No, I think it's a, 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 
I think there's a sense of sort of job well done and a sense of sadness. Mm. I mean, I, I think my reaction and Nushka's reaction was very different. I mean, I, I had always uh, envisaged, uh, having been a lawyer and having been involved with lots of buying and selling businesses, I'd seen it from the other side. And I've always loved the transactional side of business. And therefore, this is the ultimate transaction to sell your own business to somebody else. And was, a, in a way, a validation of what you created, the fact that people were willing to bid for it. Mm -hmm. um, for Anushka, it was much more... Um, uh, uh, it was more emotional, you know, and um, and particularly since you know subsequently to to us selling it, you know, uh, twelve years on, uh, of course it collapsed, and there was a, a you know our uh, the, the 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 two guys that um, uh, who bought it from us were led off in handcuffs and are now languishing in prison in in Athens. Mm. So so um, you know it, there is a there's quite a story there. This is, this is Folly Folly. This is Folly Folly, uh, who, um, you know, who obviously succumbed to a fraud. And how, how did you feel about that, Anishka? Uh, well, I think we felt, both felt absolutely gutted about it. I mean, to, you know, uh, you entrust your business to somebody. It was, uh, when we sold it, it was, um, uh, it was doing extremely well, very profitable. And uh, over the course of 10 years, they, uh, they destroyed it. Um, so um, and and and, heartbreaking. Then, and then when we uh, and then when we were to discover that uh, as a result of uh, you know a fraud um, was uh, no it was it was very very uh, uh, upsetting. Mm, I'm sure. Just just going back a step to to the decision to to sell or, and to find uh, Folly Folly as a buyer in the in the first instance. What? Did, I think you mentioned that you were approached by them. Is that is that right? Well, we were approached by them some years before we sold it to them. Right. But um, we went through a process. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we uh, we hired an investment bank. We went through a a, a process, um, and out of that process, I think um, there were three or four uh, offers, and uh, we we chose uh, the the folly folly offer. So, so the, the investment bank ran ran a, the beauty parade process. They ran a they ran a, a, a good process. Um, Folly Folly were not the highest offer, uh, but they were the most uh, straightforward deal. Mm -hmm. and I think as an entrepreneur selling a business, you're you're nervous that it's not going to happen. You know, you've already spent the money in your head, and you're ready to move on. Mm. And the biggest worry is that you're going to the transaction might abort, which mm -hmm. can be very damaging. Um, and I've done, you know, I've done a number of these uh, um, uh, processes. We had the same at all of our Brown, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, they can be, you know, they take a long time, and they can be uh, quite, quite a roller coaster. Sure. So how long? How long did the entire process take from uh, appointing the investment bank through to uh, getting the check? Uh, about six and a half months. Oh. That's relatively quick. Yeah, not bad. I came back from uh, from my Christmas holiday, pressed the button, must have been on the 28th of December, and I think we sold in mid-July. Yeah. And then a big holiday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We went off to Greece. Lovely. And, <laughs> and uh, how long did it take you, uh, as two entrepreneurs with that, with that entrepreneurial flame, how long did it take you, having sold Link, to think, yep, now's the time to, to, to pick up and start again? Well, I, you know, I'd started, um, I, I'd started, I, at this stage, I very quickly, I made the investment into Bremont. And that was very interesting. Uh, Nick and Giles English came to see me with a suitcase full of watch samples and said, what do you think? And I thought they were wonderful. Um, and three months later, it launched, and there was quite a lot to do around that. So I wasn't entirely uh, without anything to do. Um, and then I did. I launched Brands of Tomorrow very quickly thereafter. So I sort of kept myself busy um, whilst Anushka dug up the garden three times and remodelled it. Um, and she definitely needed a job. 
Um, so I mean, we I think I think within a uh, within a few months after a bit of travel, we both decided we'd like to have another go. Just just to close uh, today with you, John, I'd like to ask you what what's the biggest lesson you've learned across across your experience of being a a business a founder, a business owner, and, and an investor. What what's the biggest piece of, of, of advice or lesson learned that, that you that you would want to share with budding entrepreneurs? I think, well, never underestimate an entrepreneur. I mean, um, we've been through COVID. It's been a, been a really, really difficult time. I'm, um, I, I was the sort of earliest investor in a, a, a wonderful business called Grind Coffee. And we had uh, 12 restaurants at the beginning of COVID and a tiny little business that produced uh, sort of um, coffee pods and uh, loose coffee. Um, we, 12 months later, we now have a bunch of restaurants that are still shut. And we have a coffee pod business that is bigger than the restaurant business was 12 months ago. Wow. It's absolutely extraordinary. And we have uh, you know, 20 something thousand subscribers. And it's extraordinary. And, and David Abrahamovich, who's the, 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 uh, the, the founder, the entrepreneur behind it, has reinvented himself. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely extraordinary that he could have achieved that in a 12 month period. So I think that, that I guess that, that's what I find exciting. That's why I like meeting entrepreneurs. Like I like socializing entrepreneurs. I think they have just, I mean, terrific uh, resilience, ingenuity and, and determination. Fantastic. John Aiton, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you this afternoon. Thank you for all of your advice and, and tips there for, for future entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a lot there for them to take away. So no, thank you very much. We really appreciate well, that, your time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Collier Bristow.